Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we are getting back to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight in particular we are back to our study of the book of Numbers within this larger series of lessons. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 18. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can leave a comment in the YouTube video in the comment section there. You can send me a message personally, info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we hope to be taking a look at Numbers chapters 18, 19, and 20. And tonight we're going to be taking a leap forward, and I say that because when we move from Numbers 19 into Numbers 20, we actually fast forward to the 40th year in the wilderness. We basically skip directly from some point, I believe in the second year, all the way to the beginning of year number 40. So we're going to note that when it happens in our study tonight, but for now we're going to pick up where we left off last week. If you remember, Korah had led a rebellion against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Moses had suggested a showdown of sorts, and God, of course, settled that matter by having the earth swallow up Korah and his people. All those who took his side in burning the incense uh, were immediately then burned to a crisp. And of course, that should have settled it. For most normal people, they would kind of get the hint, hint there. Uh, this is not something we need to be doing. Uh, however, they continued to complain even after that. Uh, less than 24 hours later, they're back to whining. And so at this point, um, God is extremely upset. He sends a plague that is stopped only when Aaron steps in to intercede with some kind of a sacrifice. And God then has the leaders of each tribe put their staffs in the tent of meeting. And this is going to be another test, another showdown, so to speak. And the next morning, Aaron's staff had not only budded, but it had also blossomed and even had fresh almonds on it. So at this point, the people, uh, they do finally get the point, it seems. They are absolutely, completely, utterly terrified. And in fact, in the last verse of number 17, they say to Moses, we will die, we are lost, we are all lost, anyone who even comes near the tabernacle of the Lord will die, are we all going to die? And so that's how we left it off uh, last week at the end of chapter 17. So the people get the message, they are completely, absolutely, utterly terrified of maybe even ever approaching God again. They don't even know if they're going to survive this one. And so we're going to pick up tonight with God's response to their concern. This brings us to Numbers 18, verses 1 through 7. Numbers 18, 1 through 7. Let's look at God's answer to their terror in approaching him in worship. Numbers 18, 1 through 7. So the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's household with you shall bear the guilt in connection with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the guilt in connection with your priesthood. But bring with you also your brothers, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and serve you, while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. And they shall thus attend to your obligation and the obligation of all the tent, but they shall not come near to the furnishings of the sanctuary and the altar or both they and you will die. They shall be joined with you and attend to the obligations of the tent of meeting for all the service of the tent, but an outsider may not come near you. So you shall attend to the obligations of the sanctuary and the obligations of the altar, so that there will no longer be wrath on the sons of Israel. Behold, I myself have taken your fellow Levites from among the sons of Israel. They are a gift to you dedicated to the Lord to perform the service for the tent of meeting. But you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything concerning the altar and inside the veil, and you are to perform service. I am giving you the priesthood as a bestowed service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Now, if I've understood this correctly, it seems to me as if God, in response to the rebellion, puts an even tighter restriction on who can serve in the tabernacle itself. So, Again, if I've understood this correctly, now it's not just the Levites, but it is Aaron and his immediate descendants in particular. So either that, either he narrows this down at this point, or perhaps he's just clarifying and explaining this again. But whichever the case may be, he is very clear now that not just any Levite, but only certain Levites are allowed to serve inside the tabernacle itself. And anybody else who comes inside that veil and tries to serve will die. 
So in a sense then, when the people are terrified at the end of chapter 17, God responds pretty much by saying, you should be terrified. So he doesn't say, no, you misunderstood. It's not really that big of a deal. Worship isn't uh, as scary as you think it is. No, it is. And as we learn back in Leviticus, worship is dangerous. And he simply repeats this here. And instead of loosening up, he actually gives them more restrictions, uh, more protections, we might say, to keep them alive as they go forward. Well, we won't read all of it word for word since we're doing something of an overview here. We don't want to get bogged down in numbers. But in the rest of this chapter, God now speaks to Aaron directly, and he explains the offerings that come in are to belong to Aaron and to his sons and to his daughters. And, and God points out in the rest of this chapter that the offerings that are brought in are Aaron's share. If you remember, the other tribes would all be given land, but the Levites were not to be given land. They were the priests, and since they would be serving uh, all of the other tribes, the Levites were to make their living off of the sacrifices that the people would bring to the Lord. And so the Levites would be given the finest olive oil, the finest of the wine and the grain, the first fruits of the harvest and the crops and so on. And this was to be their payment for serving as priests. This is how they would make a living. This was to be their inheritance. This was to be their portion from the Lord. And this was something that was given to them that the other tribes didn't have because the other tribes had land. And, and they actually had farms and they were to be given, um, you know, flocks and herds and all of that. Uh, if you remember hundreds of years after this, hundreds of years later, the prophet Jeremiah was actually a priest. He was a Levitical priest. And he warned the people that God told him what to say. He passed it along. And he warned the people literally for years and years, even decades. And you need to turn away from sin or these terrible things are going to happen. And then when the city of Jerusalem was finally destroyed, you may remember that Jeremiah, as a priest, survived that initial attack. And Jeremiah sat down and watched the smoke rise from a nearby hillside. And this is what he said over in uh, Lamentations 3, 22 and through 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. When Jeremiah said that the Lord is my portion, he was saying that as a Levitical priest, the Lord himself was his inheritance. As a priest, he didn't have any land. This was not in God's plan. He was not a land owner. And so when Jerusalem was destroyed, he realized that the Lord truly was his portion or his inheritance. And God explains this to Aaron throughout the rest of this chapter, starting in Numbers 18, verse 8, and following down through the end. So instead of a portion of land, God himself was the inheritance that would be given to the Levites on an ongoing basis as the people brought the best of the best to God. They were actually bringing these things to the Levites which was to pay them for their service in the temple and to pay them for their intercession, for going to God on their behalf. That was their job. That was their work. And they were paid uh, through those sacrifices. And of course, Paul, uh, in fact, brings this up in 1 Corinthians 9, where God carries this over into the new covenant as his plan for financially supporting those who preach the gospel. Those who preach the gospel have a right to make a living that way, just like the Levites did here in Numbers chapter 18. So I wanted to point that out because we do have some New Testament connections in a few different ways uh, to this uh, chapter here, Numbers chapter 18. Again, we're not going to read every verse in this chapter, uh, but I do want us to skip ahead to a passage that I absolutely love. This is... Uh, it's hard to have like a favorite verse in the book of Numbers, but uh, this probably isn't it. It may be in the top 10, just this concept here. But I want us to look tonight at Numbers 18, skipping ahead to verses 25 and 26. Just an interesting concept here. Numbers 18, 25 and 26. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. 
I think a lot of people have perhaps missed this, but I remember learning about this several years ago and just being impressed. So everybody has to be giving 10%. And this 10% goes to the priest. Well, now God says that the priest must also give 10% of the 10%. And I love this, first of all, because it's fair. Uh, the priests are not exempt from this. The priests are not exempt from giving themselves. Just because they're on the receiving end of God's mercy and God's blessing through his people, they also have to give. And so they're giving just like everybody else is giving. But secondly, I think God also knows that there is a joy in giving, or at least there should be. I think if we're doing it correctly, obviously there is. And we, we read those verses about um, giving with a cheerful heart uh, over in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, some uh, wonderful verses there. But to exempt the Levites from giving, you know, like if this wasn't in there, if God said, no, you don't have to give because you're actually receiving, that would be robbing them of the joy of giving. And I hope we understand that. And I know we're not bound by the 10% rule today. We are to give cheerfully. We are to give in a planned way. We are to give as we've been prospered. We're to give on the first day of every week and so on. We have a number of rules we might say that we need to follow today. Uh, but I am thankful that gospel preachers also get to experience the joy of giving. I think that's a wonderful thing, and uh, I am thankful for that blessing. As most of you know, I am not good at math, so I, I hope you will forgive what I'm about to say. Um, but in my feeble math brain, um, think about it this way. Instead of giving 10%, instead of telling the priest to give 10%, God could have just had everybody in Israel give 9%, thus lowering the salary of the priests, and God could have then exempted the priest from giving. In other words, their giving could have been taken out of their salary before they ever got it. God could have arranged it that way. You know, financially, it would have been the same, the same difference, as we sometimes say. However, I do think God knew that there is a value to giving. And so he wanted his priests to experience that. He wanted them to lead by example. And so also today, preachers, even when supported by the congregation, need to be giving appropriately, uh, just as everybody else does as well. So I just didn't want us to miss those two verses there because I think it's an interesting uh, application and some principles for us to consider today. So let's continue tonight with Numbers 19, verses 1 through 10. The next paragraph, moving over into chapter 19. Numbers 19, 1 through 10. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel that they bring you an unblemished red heifer, in which is no defect and on which a yoke has never been placed. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest, and it shall be brought outside the camp and, sl and be slaughtered in his presence. Next, Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide and its flesh and its blood with its refuse shall be burned. The priest shall take cedar, wood, and hyssop and scarlet material and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. The priest shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward come into the camp, but the priest shall be unclean until evening. The one who burns it shall also wash his clothes in water and bathe his body in water, and shall be unclean until evening. Now a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place, and the congregation of the sons of Israel shall keep it as water to remove impurity. It is purification from sin. The one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening, and it shall be a perpetual statute to the sons of Israel and to the alien who sojourns among them. This is weird. Okay, this is a bit unusual because we have instructions for killing a red heifer. But I hope we notice in that paragraph that the red heifer is not really offered as a sacrifice. But instead, the instruction is to then use the ashes of this animal almost as a form of holy water, as I might describe it. That's not really what it is. But the ashes are to then be mixed in water, and this water is to then be used in uh, some purification ritual. So we're going to skip over the rest of this chapter, but God gives instructions from this verse forward through the rest of chapter 19 
for purifying people uh, after touching dead bodies for various reasons. Okay, so if you want to read the rest of chapter 19, go for it. But I think we got the main point here. They are to uh, torch the red heifer and collect the ashes, put that outside the camp, mix that with water, and that's going to be their water that they use for uh, cleansing people ceremonially. So, if again, if you want to read the rest, go for it. But this brings us to Numbers chapter 20. So let's go ahead into chapter 20. We're going to start with Numbers chapter 20, verse number 1. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Then the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. So this right here is where we fast forward to the beginning of their 40th year in the wilderness. And you know, I kind of wish it had said the beginning of the 40th year. It doesn't say that here. But we know this is true because later in this chapter, Aaron's going to die in verses uh, 22 through 29. Sorry to spoil that for you, but it's coming. Um, so Aaron's going to die in verses 20 through 29, and then we combine that with a reference in Numbers 33, 38, where we find that Aaron dies in the 40th year. So we kind of combine all of this together, and Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, therefore, is a record of what happens beginning in the 40th year. And this is a bit strange to me, uh, this this uh, 37 plus years that we've just spanned over. We have no record almost of, of what happens for roughly 38 years, from sometime in the second year all the way to year number 40. They wander, and that's about all we know. There's just this huge blank space that we really don't have any information on. Uh, but the news here, the new information that we have now is that Miriam dies. The people are camped out at Kadesh again. And uh, Miriam dies while they're there, and she is buried. And that's pretty remarkable to have the uh, record of the death of an ancient woman, that this is significant. And so she was a very important part of the congregation and had played a role in some of, the, I think, the, the, the uh, decisions that had been made over the previous 40 years, certainly as a, a supporter to Moses and Aaron. So let's continue then with Numbers 20, verses 2 through 8, the next paragraph. Numbers 20, 2 through 8. Let's look at what happens next. There was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod. And you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. It's interesting that something very similar had happened almost 40 years earlier. If you remember, when they first left Egypt, somewhere between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai, I believe, the people complained about a lack of water back in Exodus 17. And God told Moses to take the staff that he used in Egypt and to strike a rock, and that water would then come out of that rock, which it did. Well, now, nearly 40 years later, the people once again, new generation comes on the scene, and the, the kids and the grandkids of that first crew again complain about a lack of water. And to me, this is almost like a test. You know, God could have provided water in a way where they would not have complained for it. But maybe he let them just get a little bit thirsty. Whatever it is, it, it seems to me to come across almost like a test. If you remember, most of the original complainers are now dead. And so these, again, would have been the children and maybe grandchildren of the first complainers. It kind of runs in the family, doesn't it? And their complaining sounds very, very familiar. It's almost word for word. So they suggest that Moses just brought these people out in the wilderness so they would die. Absolutely ridiculous. That is not what Moses had in mind. It's almost as if they're still longing for Egypt. 
which by the way is a place that I think most of these people have never even been. They've only heard about it. So they've been listening to their parents and grandparents talk about how wonderful it was back in Egypt. So Moses and Aaron then, they, they take this to God. And I think that's wise on their part right there. And notice God says, take your staff and go speak to this rock over there and water is going to pour out. So that they're familiar with this. They've done something similar before. So let's continue then with Numbers 20 verses 9 through 13. Numbers 20, 9 through 13. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he, is, he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Those were the waters of Meribah, because the sons of Israel contended with the Lord, and he proved himself holy among them. All right, so God tells Moses to speak to the rock. However, instead of speaking to the rock as God had instructed, notice Moses almost has an attitude, doesn't he? He's not very humble here. I mean, it's and it's hard to blame him for, for having this attitude. I mean, he's now decades older than almost everybody. He's been traveling for 40 years now, and he started this journey when he was 80. Okay, so he's a, an older man. And when he speaks to the people, by the way, that right there, remember God said, speak to the rock, didn't he? Moses doesn't speak to the rock. He, he speaks to the people, and when he speaks to the people, he almost seems a little bit arrogant. Listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And I don't know about you, but to me, he almost seems to be bringing attention to himself, doesn't he? You know, look at what I'm about to do for you people. It almost sounds like, a, like an arrogant mayor or a governor or a president. You know, I've done this. And look at this thing that I'm going to do for all you people, not realizing that the people put him or her in that position. And he or she is spending their money. And so it's kind of a similar arrogant attitude there. And so Moses is, is pointing the attention to himself. And then, of course, instead of speaking to the rock, as God had instructed, he not only doesn't speak to it, he speaks to the people instead. And now he strikes the rock, uh, not just once, but twice. And, you know, it's interesting to me, and I've kind of thought about this a little bit through the years, that it actually works. If I'm God here and Moses strikes the rock instead of speaking to it and has that attitude, I'm thinking, um, nope, no water. <laughs> you guys aren't going to have water today, you know, until you ask nicely next time, until you follow my instructions and so on. But I'm kind of amazed, however, God, he still provides water. I mean, after all, he is merciful. The people do need water. It's not their fault that Moses does this the incorrect way with a bad attitude. But the consequence here falls on Moses and Aaron. They are the ones responsible for this. And so God explains that these two men will not be able to lead the, men, the, the, lead the people into the promised land. And note the reason. Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of of Israel. Isn't that pretty much the problem that uh, came up earlier with Nadab and Abihu? They failed to treat God as holy. All right, so they forgot they were serving God. And in my mind, they were kind of thinking of their leadership role as if they were leading some secular organization somewhere, like I'm the CEO, I'm the president or something, you know, I'm the I'm the guy in charge. In reality, these two men should have been trembling before the Lord themselves in this position. But as it is, if I could say this, they got cocky. They started playing fast and loose with it, and they kind of got a little too arrogant, and they they got you know, kind of played fast and loose with the rules and let things slide, and and got arrogant. And God had to uh, had to take a toll in a sense. These men needed to be reminded that God, in fact, is uh, holy as He is. All right, let's continue with the next uh, paragraph, Numbers twenty, verses fourteen through twenty-two. Numbers twenty. 14 through 22. From Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. 
Thus your brother Israel has said, You know the hardship that has befallen us, that our fathers went down to Egypt, and we stayed in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians treated us and our fathers badly. But when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out from Egypt. Now behold, we are at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or through vineyard. We will not even drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway, not turning to the right or left until we pass through your territory. Edom, however, said to him, You shall not pass through us, or I will come out with the sword against you. Again, the sons of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway, and if I and my livestock do drink any of your water, then I will pay its price. Let me only pass through on my feet, nothing else. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against him with a heavy force and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. Now when they set out from Kadesh, the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to Mount Hor. Well, we have a strange and I think rather uh, unusual and I think unfortunate footnote here. Uh, as they get ready to head toward the promised land, Moses sends messengers to the Edomites who were between them and where they needed to be. And they ask permission to pass through their land. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. And so these people are distant relatives. Uh, Moses explains everything they've been through. He explains they'll stay on the main road. We're not going to take anything on our way through. We won't even drink your water. We got this rock that gives us water. <laughs> so we're not even, we're, we won't be a burden. We're not going to be like locusts coming through your land, stripping everything. In fact, Edom refuses though, and he goes beyond. He even threatens violence. And Moses asks again, the king not only refuses a second time, but this time, as I see it, the king of Edom sends his military. And they meet them there like, you will not come through this land. And this is a strange account. In my mind, first of all, because I don't see Moses consulting God on this one, do you? So it's somewhat similar, I think, to the striking of the rock incident. Remember, the people would get up and move when the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud got up and moved. And so if the pillar is not moving, then why is Moses asking the king of Edom for permission to move? And then another question here, if God is leading them, then why is permission even necessary? Because if God wanted them to go through Edom, they would go through Edom. And so that's why I say this is a rather strange footnote here. And the only thing I can figure is the, the possibility in, in context is that since God has just told Moses and Aaron that they are not going to be allowed to lead the people into the promised land, that these two are perhaps planning a way to get there themselves without God's help. I'm not saying that this is the case, but personally, I'm just wondering whether this might be a possibility. And I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I, it, it almost seems like Moses is acting on his own here. God is not telling them to do this as far as the biblical record indicates. Otherwise, asking for permission to travel through Edom without God leading them through Edom is kind of a strange thing. Because again, if God wanted them to go there, he would take care of it. So I, I'm open to the possibility that uh, Moses and Aaron are trying to override what God just said about not pressing forward, um, not being able to lead the people into the uh, promised land. So I don't know, I'm not saying that's the case, but uh, I'm, I'm at least open to that as a possibility because of how strange this is. So let's conclude tonight by looking at the last paragraph, Numbers 20, verses 23 through 29. Numbers 20, 23 through 29. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron will be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the sons of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar. So Aaron will be gathered to his people and will die there. So Moses did just as the Lord had commanded, and they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. When all the congregation saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron thirty days. Well, God then speaks to Moses and pretty much explains it's time for Aaron to die. And he's going to be dying due to what just happened at the waters of Meribah. What happens next then is a transfer of the high priesthood from Aaron to his son Eleazar. Moses is to take the priestly garments off Aaron 
and to put them on Aaron's son, Eleazar. This is what Moses does. They go up to Mount Hor. Aaron dies on top of that mountain, and the people weep for Aaron for 30 days. So the only old guys left now, pretty much as far as we know at least, are Moses and Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else who was 20 or older 40 years earlier was now dead or would be dead within the next year. So we're coming here very near to the end of the wandering in the wilderness. So that brings us to the end of the first 20 chapters of Numbers. Uh, next week, if the Lord wills, let's pick up with Numbers chapter 21. Again, as always, thank you very much for being with us tonight. If there's anything that we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you as a congregation, we want to, again, invite you to reach out. You can send an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we are so thankful for your word brought to us tonight through your servant Moses. We ask for your help in learning from the example of your people from so long ago. Good examples and bad examples, both are so helpful to us. Forgive us, Father, when we whine and complain, but Father, lead us beyond that and make us the kind of people who look for ways to help instead of complaining about how things are done. Tonight we ask that you be with the seniors of the congregation. We pray for your blessing on them and on their example. We're thankful for those who are still strong and we pray for those who are struggling. Be with our teachers who are at the beginning of a new school year this week. We ask that you bless them with ways to bless others as this new year begins. Father, we pray a special blessing on those who are starting a new year at college. Be with Silas and Eau Claire and be with others from far off places who have come here to Madison to learn and to study. And we ask for your help as we encourage them to stay faithful to you as they're far from home. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We love you and we come to you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.